So our first commentator is Siobhan Byrne. She's an assistant professor in the Department of Political Science at the University of Alberta. She's also the director of the Peace and Post Conflict Studies Certificate. So she's interested in precisely these kinds of situations that we're dealing with in Ukraine today. So I'll hand you the microphone. Great, thanks. I might try and... Yeah. Uh, there we go. Yeah, I have my hands free. Okay. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'll preface my comments just by saying that I have only had um, the opportunity to take just a cursory peek at the papers here. So my comments will reflect both um, uh, my peek at the papers, but also the presentations as they unfold it. Um, so with those limits in mind, um, I'll offer some, uh, some of my thoughts. I think each of these papers variously grapples with the problem of how we come to understand rapidly changing facts on the ground in Ukraine. And as a political scientist, I'm actually not sure how much help I can provide because we are notorious for needing time and distance to offer any kind of um, analysis. We tend to be rear view mirror drivers, um, particularly in international relations, which is my area. So IR scholars um, have actually been very poor at addressing the Maidan protests and what's unfolding in Ukraine at this moment. Um, I think each author notes with surprise the presentation and in the papers the pace at which the dramatic events began to unfold. Particularly for the last two, there's an attempt to account for this reassertion of, um, of a kind of Ukrainian national identity and also a Russian um, uh, national identity. All of a sudden, it seems as though ethno-nationalism, ethno-national identity has erupted on the scene. And this seems surprising to us, I think, because we imagine somehow that the forces of globalization and regionalism have ushered in a moment of cosmopolitanism, that we are in a period where ethno-national divisions are supposed to be dissolving in favor of improved economic ties, free movement across borders, reduced transaction costs, global cultural exchanges. The original Maidan protests seemed to be a rejection in some ways of old world versions of ethnic nationalism. Indeed, they were protests over building closer relationships with uh, Europe. So it's in this cosmopolitan moment um, we see this, it seems surprising to us to see this rearticulation of nationalism. And by nationalism, we mean here what Walker Connor calls ethno-nationalism, not a kind of patriot, patriotic nationalism or civic nationalism, but one tied to a sense of uh, belonging. Um, but perhaps it's not so surprising at all. Despite our sense that we are very cosmopolitan and we are all becoming uh, global citizens, the post-Cold War era, and especially now, how what we refer to as the post 9-11 era has ushered in what Mary Calder calls the kind of new wars. Perhaps it's this moment of uncertainty that ethnic attachments become all the more relevant. Perhaps it's the chauvinism of a number of power hungry elites. Perhaps ethno-national identities never really went away and they were always just waiting to emerge in the right, under the right kinds of political conditions um, or context. Um, we have in, uh, um, in the, the second panelist talked about a celebration of Ukrainian um, national liberation figures in Ukrainian textbooks, replacing old Soviet heroes. Um, and no matter how the political rulers of Ukraine worked to build alliances with Russia, Ukraine was intent on carving out its sort of own character. And um, as March, the first uh, panelist describes, all of a sudden, 2013, 2014, everyone is suddenly paying attention to Ukraine. The Maidan protests, Russian troops, Russian troops in Crimea, conflict in eastern Ukraine. She offers us perhaps the bleakest prognosis. We can't ever really know what's happening in Ukraine. The media have so few correspondents on the ground. I remember myself watching Susan Ormiston, um, and I think also Nala Aid for uh, CBC News covering the events, um, and thinking they must be so tired. They just get on the plane, and then they're covering um, events as they're unfolding in Africa and through South America. Um, but I wonder also if there was this moment of media attention, thanks in part to the Sochi Games, also the downing of the Malaysian aircraft. These were all big moments that turned the spotlight on international, of international attention. 
So I guess my question um, for Marta about media framing, Russia versus Europe, East versus West, Ukraine, police versus protester, um, you suggest that these sort of obscure the, the uh, true meaning of the events. And um, I think we might have to think about the war on terror now as well, um, obscuring the meaning of events as they fold uh, in Russia at the moment. Um, what is it that we are failing to see? So my background is actually in journalism. I trained as a journalist. And your formulation, this normative um, formulation of um, you have to have a balanced perspective on every story, that's what I learned. You have two sides to every story, and then you have the talking head in between who helps to mediate it. Um, I've now become a talking head as a political scientist. And you yourself know that you gave over 100 interviews um, uh, on, as on, did many others. as did many others based on what was happening in Ukraine. So there's something um, not very satisfying about being that talking head. Um, what is it that we're missing from the bigger picture? Are there avenues in, that might open up that we could, we could learn more? So um, for the uh, second uh, uh, presenter, Voldemir Kulik, um, who describes going to Facebook. And you yourself in your presentation describe um, translating interviews on radio. What are the things that you're learning when you pay careful attention to the voices of everyday people there? And how is it that we can communicate those kinds of things in a timely way that um, uh, well the world is watching, so to speak? Um, Do you want me to answer now, or do you want to? I, I think I'll just, yeah, I'll just go through through my questions, and then, yeah. Um, um, and then the political economy of the global media system. Uh, um, I wonder about, um, is, is there um, motivation, in your view, just simply one that's about um, capturing what is going to be the most um, interesting for the viewers visually, or is there some other kind of um, agenda that is being set there, um, particularly with relationship to Ukraine? Are we talking about something that is um, a problem for all kinds of conflicts that are being covered? Or is there something unique about um, what's unfolding uh, right now? It makes me think about some of um, the work um, and, and the attention that I've paid to the Arab Spring, for example, where um, people um, uh, began to interview those who went into um, public squares and were protesting and, and Twitter was social media and Twitter and Facebook and this is where even CBC and CNN, they were getting all their information about what was happening on the ground. So these kind of new places where we might find, um, we might, we might find a better picture of what's actually happening. So my question is, new places to find a better picture and just what does that better picture look like? What is it um, that you feel that you haven't been able to say when they tell you you've just got three minutes? Um, for the second, Voldemir Kulik, for the second speaker, um, the change that you're beginning to measure is so um, fascinating between, uh, where is the second speaker? I'm, sitting back here. Oh, sitting back here. <laughs> Thank you. I've been looking, looking you for you in the up? audience. Well, why don't you come up? So the change that you're noting between 2012 and 2014, it's such a short period of time. And I wonder, I guess my first question for you is, what accounts for the change in that short period of time? And is it something that we can say, to, are we learning something about Ukrainian nationalism and Russian nationalism in that very short period? Um, or is this a kind of unique moment? Do we need more time and distance in order to understand what some of those um, uh, responses are that you're getting from people? And you, you rushed through um, um, the scripts that people reported to you um, when in the in the focus group interviews, and those were the things that I was really curious about when I read the paper. And as as you were speaking, what were the things that people said? And it occurred to me, so the way that you're measuring identity, there's sort of national identity, gender identity, religious identity, all of these discrete sort of um, identity projects or silos. My area is um, feminist international relations, and one of the things that they uh, feminist IR scholars try to do is think about how these identities are intersectional. And I wonder, in the interviews, if you've uncovered ways in which um, gender and nationalism have worked together in new and surprising ways um, uh, through the things that people have uh, suggested to you. 
And you mentioned gender just a couple of times in the paper, and I guess I wanted to ask you what your thought uh, is on why it is that nationaliz nationalism and gender um, are the two most important ways in which people express their identity to you. Um, and and was, that, was that surprising? Um, so for the, for the final speaker um, about the Russian politics of memory, I love this term, um, a new future requires a new past. I have a student who's a master's student, and she's working on um, a new Israeli-Palestinian textbook that attempts to tell the history of both people in one book. And it writes the Israeli history on one side and the Palestinian history on the other side. And there's no attempt to mediate it, but it's thought that having them parallel or side by side is a useful way forward. Um, that textbook is banned in Israel. It's only in France, actually, that I think that they're using it. So that might say something about um, that kind of project. But I wonder, in your view, in thinking about the future of um, reading the tea leaves, I suppose, because these events are still changing, but the future um, for the Russian speaking in Ukraine, what will memorial uh, projects look like? How will this, um, how will a new future write a new past that will bring together the people that are left in a future Ukraine? What will um, the Russian speaking population, um, how will they be written into the future of Ukraine? I guess is my kind of sort of broader question. Um, a number of years ago, David Layton wrote about. Um, uh, what he called the Russian-speaking people as though it was going to be, um, he anticipated it might be a distinct kind of ethnic group, something divorced from a nationalizing community with Russia. Um, I'm not sure whether that's borne out. Um, so I wonder then what, what happens next, I guess, in terms of what could be progressive kind of memorial projects? Um, what would a museum look like? What would a textbook look like that includes um, uh, the various peoples in Ukraine? And um, so on that, those are my... Um, Sorry, I'm just making oh, I'm sure. Sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. just okay, okay. Clarifying that, that mm -hmm. the question was clear. So the, what would a memorial look like that includes... What is the uh, Russian-speaking uh, population? A Russian-speaking population, uh, a lot of uh, Ukrainian nationalists. Mm -hmm. Russian speaking. Right. I have such placard. Right. I am a Russian speaking Ukrainian nationalist. Right. <laughs> yes. What, what if we speak about, about the uh, Donetsk uh, region, yeah. uh, for example, or uh, tiny, tiny strata of pro Russian uh, Russian nationalists in Ukraine, but we not speak with them at all. It's not now. We have no dialogue. We have now war. Right. 